Elon Musk is aiming for a moon project that sounds unreal, and he wants to begin it in 2028. SpaceX's idea is often described as Moon Base Alpha, and some people even call it AA City, short for Audacity mixed with Lunar City. That nickname isn't official, but it fits the whole vibe. Big, fast, and built around one simple weapon of choice, Starship. The plan is to place the first serious foothold near the Moon's South Pole, right by Shackleton Crater. That spot is not random. It's picked because parts of Shackleton's rim can get sunlight for long stretches, while the crater's interior stays in permanent shadow and extreme cold. NASA has pointed out that these permanently shadowed regions can trap water ice, and that ice could become a real resource for future crews. If you can reach it, you're not just talking about drinking water. You're talking about oxygen and even propellant ingredients. 2028 anchor that makes this more than a fan dream. SpaceX's own moon page says Starship cargo flights to the lunar surface for research, development, and exploratory missions start in 2028. That doesn't mean a full city appears overnight, but it does mean SpaceX is publicly putting a lunar surface cargo timeline on the calendar in writing. Now comes the clever part. Instead of shipping a separate habitat first, the concept is to land Starship and use the ship itself as the starter base, a base without a base. It's basically saying, why build a building when your rocket is already a giant pressure vessel? Skylab was built by repurposing hardware from a Saturn V stage, turning rocket structure into a livable volume instead of throwing it away. And when you compare that mindset to something like the International Space Station, you can see why the reuse the hardware approach looks tempting. NASA's Inspector General has reported that the ISS costs on the order of several billion dollars per year to operate and support. A Starship first base is trying to avoid that kind of slow, expensive assembly story in the early phase. NASA and SpaceX have shown that the human landing system version is designed for lunar use, not Earth re-entry, which changes what the vehicle needs to carry and how it's built. The point is simple. If it's not coming home to Earth, you don't design it like a plane. You design it like a lander and a habitat. Inside, Starship is huge compared to past crew vehicles. The internal volume people discuss for Starship scale vehicles is measured in hundreds of cubic meters, not tens. That single fact is why the ship as habitat idea is even on the table. You can actually fit a real living setup inside. Not comfy by Earth standards, but workable. From there, the vision gets more ambitious. After landing, you'd strip out what you don't need, and you'd build a proper interior layout. You add internal floors, walls, lighting, air handling, water lines, and wiring. You carve out sleeping zones, work areas, a galley, hygiene space, storage, and a place to exercise. In other words, you stop treating the ship like a vehicle, and start treating it like a building. And then we reach the part that sounds completely insane at first. You tip it over. To be clear, SpaceX has not published a step-by-step -step guide that says, yes, we will knock Starship onto its side. This is a proposed concept that shows up in serious discussions because it solves a practical problem. A rocket standing upright is a tall tower. Movement becomes ladders, hatches, and constant up and down but lay that cylinder down and suddenly the full length becomes one long, usable space. It becomes a single level interior, more like a hallway in a long submarine than a vertical shaft. So how would you lower something that massive without smashing it? You'd do it slowly and with control. The moon helps you because gravity is about one-sixth of Earth's, which means the vehicle effectively weighs far less than it would at home. But the surface can still betray you. Lunar soil is sharp, dusty and tricky, and traction isn't always predictable. One approach is the cable pull. You attach heavy cables high on the ship, then drive a large rover away at a crawl, pulling the vehicle down like a controlled lever. Another approach is a winch and anchor setup. Think of a powerful winch bolted to a solid anchor point, with a cable running to the ship's upper section. You tighten the line slowly until the ship rotates down onto prepared supports. Either way, the real word here is gentle. You don't want a crash. You want a controlled settling. 
Before any of that, you'd likely prep the ground. You'd compact regolith, build up a firmer base, and make sure the ship won't slip as it starts to rotate. You're trying to turn a dusty slope into something more like a stable pad. Once the ship is down, the real transformation starts. That's when the base stops being a concept and becomes a construction job. It's not a weekend project. Every task in a suit takes longer. Every seal matters. Dust gets into everything. And any mistake with pressure integrity is not a minor problem. It's a life or death problem. That's why robotic help keeps coming up in these conversations. Whether it's purpose-built lunar construction bots or humanoid robots doing internal work, the reason is obvious. Robots can do repetitive work in a vacuum without needing oxygen breaks. They can work longer shifts. They can handle dirty jobs that would wear down a crew fast. It doesn't remove the hard parts, but it can speed up progress and reduce risk. Now, let's talk power, because none of this matters if you can't keep the lights on. The entire reason Shackleton's Rim is so popular in planning is illumination. NASA has highlighted that Shackleton has an illuminated rim and a permanently shadowed interior, and those shadowed regions are also where ice may persist. Separate NASA research has mapped high illumination regions at the lunar poles, including the rim of Shackleton, because the lighting conditions there can be far better than most of the moon. Solar energy in space starts with a simple number, NASA's solar irradiance work cites a total solar irradiance value around 1,361 watts per square meter at Earth's distance from the Sun. On the Moon, you don't lose energy to an atmosphere, but panel angle, dust, and temperature still affect what you actually get as usable electricity. Still, if you can keep panels in sunlight most of the time, you've solved one of the biggest base problems right away. Even then, you don't rely on one power method. You want backup, and you want options. One idea that's getting attention in the wider space industry is optical power beaming. Starcatcher, for example, describes a system that collects and concentrates sunlight and transmits it so spacecraft can generate more power on demand, in some cases claiming a multiple times boost. Whether that exact approach ends up supporting a lunar base is still an open question, but the direction is clear. People are trying to treat energy like a service, not just a panel. Now, picture the base after the first ship is stable and powered. It can work as a starter habitat, but long stays demand more room. Month-long missions need storage, redundancy, and breathing space. That's where building with lunar material starts to matter. The moon is covered in regolith. If you can turn that dust and rock into structures, you can expand the base without flying every wall from Earth. And then comes the survival problem. Even a perfect habitat dies fast if it's exposed. On the moon, there's no thick air to slow down micrometeoroids, and there's no Earth-like magnetic shield to reduce radiation exposure. That means shielding is not optional, it's a requirement. A common approach is to use lunar regolith itself as the shield. Research on regolith-based habitat concepts focuses on how local material can reduce radiation exposure and protect against micrometeoroid hazards, especially when used as an outer layer. People often throw around numbers like several meters because the exact thickness depends on the design, the radiation environment you're planning for, and what risk level you accept. The big takeaway is that covering a habitat with a thick layer of lunar soil can dramatically improve crew safety. So how do you cover a ship? You use machines. Excavators, cranes, scoops, and conveyor-like systems are designed for vacuum and dust. You scoop regolith and lay it over the hull in layers, building up a protective blanket. Do it carefully so you don't stress the structure. Keep vents and access points planned out. Once that shielding is in place, the base stops looking like a shiny rocket and starts behaving like a bunker. And this is where the bigger reason shows up. The point of going back to the moon is not just a repeat of Apollo. Apollo was a masterpiece, but it was still a visit. NASA's own Apollo 17 mission details mark it as the last Apollo landing mission back in December 1972. Crews stayed days, not months. They proved we could do it, but they didn't have time to master living there long term. A long duration base changes the entire game because it forces endurance, it forces maintenance, it forces real supply planning. 
It forces you to deal with lunar dust constantly. It forces you to build routines that keep people sane when the outside world is deadly and silent. And once you can do that, you're not just learning how to live on the moon, you're rehearsing for Mars. That's why you keep hearing the phrase in situ resource utilization, or ISRU. It means you use what's already there instead of shipping everything from Earth. Lunar regolith contains oxygen bound in minerals. If you can extract it, you get oxygen for breathing and oxygen for propellant. NASA has published work on molten regolith electrolysis as a method that can produce oxygen gas and metal alloy from lunar regolith which is exactly the kind of tech that would make a lunar base more independent over time. So the chain starts to look clear. Land Starship, use it as the first shelter. Set up power where sunlight is reliable. Expand with local construction. Shield the habitat with lunar soil. Then start producing key resources like oxygen from the regolith itself. None of it is easy. But if SpaceX can pull off even the early steps on a 2028 starting timeline, it won't feel like another mission. It will feel like the moment the moon starts turning from a place we visit into a place we can actually stay. 